Good morning and welcome back to One Step at a Time Farmstead. I'm Lucas and I'm so glad that you joined us today. As a hobby, I enjoy homebrewing some craft beers and fruit wine ciders and even distilling some craft whiskies and brandies, rums and making liqueurs from it and stuff like that. My wife really, really loves the fruit wine that I make. A while ago, we made some mixed berries, you know, wine from some mixed berries and she really loved it. That was her favorite out of everything that I made. That mixed berry wine was her favorite. So she asked me to make a, another batch. Okay. Obviously, at this moment, we don't have a lot of our own berries and fruits and stuff like that. So, yeah, next best thing is to buy fruit juices. And she picked this berry blaze from liquid fruit. Now, there's nothing wrong with using store-bought uh, fruit juices. Uh, as long as it doesn't have any preservatives in, especially that potassium phosphate uh, that will stall your fermentation, you know, as quick as you start it. This doesn't have any preservatives in. Uh, the ingredients here is apple or grape or pear juice, which some will then argue that I'm making a cider and not a wine, but we'll get into that later. It's got mixed berry juices like strawberry puree and blackcurrant juice. It's got guava puree. Uh, it's got citrus. So yeah, we're going to use this juice to make some fruit juice wine. But as she asked me to make a new batch uh, for her, she suggested that I make a video about it because it relates to homesteading, self-sufficiency and also preserving. So should you have a great abundance of fruits and you've canned all that you can and you've preserved all that you can in a certain way and you still have left over, you can always use those fruits, especially if it comes to the end of the season and it's going to start rotting away. Um, you can use those fruits to make your own wine and that's another way to preserve your harvest as well. So we discussed it and decided to make like a beginner's course to bring your own alcoholic beverages brewing and distilling. Yeah, we decided to make like a tutorial a guide on it, um, course on it. But again, to keep it as simple and as straightforward and as unintimidating as possible. Uh, because a lot of people I find are interested in the hobbies, you know, of beer making or distilling. And this People go into so much technical and scientific detail, you know, that it seems so intimidating that they rather, you know, back away and never, never do it. So our objective for this course is to keep it as simple, as straightforward and as, as enjoyable for everyone who is interested in starting their own, own brewing journey without getting too involved in the technical and the scientific mumbo jumbo, you know, that leaves one normally intimidated and overwhelmed. Just another thing, just remember that our ancestors all over the world, in every continent, for thousands of years, they have produced their own alcoholic beverages uh, without any sophisticated equipment and 
rule books and do's and don'ts and all these kinds of regulations. Um, they simply took the natural process that, that happens in nature and harnessed it to produce their own wines, beers, and ciders, meats, and stuff like that. So it's really not that difficult and intimidating as and complex as one might believe. So this brings us to the basics of home brewing. There are basically three ingredients that you require to make an alcoholic beverage. And that is sugar, water and yeast. Those three simple ingredients will allow you to make an alcoholic beverage. Fermentable sugar, yeast and water. Simple as that. Okay, so let's start with sugar. One of the first questions that I will get is, okay, can I make alcohol from normal table sugar? And the answer quite simply is yes, you can. Although I'll advise against it, unless you are going to distill a neutral base alcohol, um, that you are going to use in another product like gin or a liqueur or something like that. The reason for this is that your yeast needs other nutrients and minerals other than just the sugar to thrive and be healthy and in order not to get stressed and produce all kinds of off flavors and smells uh, because it is under stress and obviously not really healthy. Let us think about our own bodies. We need all kinds of nutrients and minerals in order for our body to become and remain healthy and not stressed. Um, that is why we want to grow our own healthy foods because it's nutrient dense. And comparing that to our industrialized foods, which have a lot of calories, but it's not really nutritional. So we eat and we get fat, obese, and we remain sickly because our bodies don't receive all those healthy nutrients that we need in order to become healthy and to remain healthy. But yes, we get a lot of energy, ex access of energy gets stored into fat, our bodies don't function properly, mental health and all uh, those things start becoming an issue as well, along with other medical problems. So that is why we use sugars that we get from fruits and the fruit juices from uh, um, honey and uh, even from the starch in grains that we convert to fermentable sugars. Yeah, so we use either fresh, fresh juice, fruit juices, um, you can use uh, dried fruit, um, you can use grain, you can use honey, and all those things make different um, types of alcoholic beverages. As a general, as a general, as a generalized Sorry, there's some words that Afrikaans people struggle to say, and this is one of them. Generalized, as a generalized practice, we say that we make wine and ciders from fruits and berries, and there's also some dispute about that. Some people say no, wine is grapes only, but at the end of the day, we accept that we make wines and ciders from fruits and berries. We make meat from honey and we make beers from uh, grains like barley and wheat and sorghum, corn, rice, you know, grains. The second 
ingredient that we want to discuss is water. Water is an integral ingredient as it provides the ideal, I want to say environment, um, but the environment is, we'll touch on that a bit later. It provides the ideal medium or landscape for the fermentation process. You need clean, unchlorinated water, but I would advise against using purified reverse osmosis or distilled water um, because water in itself also carries some minerals and nutrients. Um, yeah, so clean, unchlorinated water. Okay, water should also not be contaminated with other uh, bacteria such as acetobacter that might uh, turn your fermentation your alcohol into vinegar or other bacteria that might completely spoil your fermentation. So we try to keep it as clean and sterile as possible, but without, you know, removing all the minerals and nutrients that are carried in water. I use normal tap water that I boil in order to sterilize it and to boil off uh, any chlorine that might be in the system and then I let it cool down to room temperature before I before I use it. Uh, you can do it the day before or you can do it a couple of days before and keep it in a in a, a sealed container. Um, it's up to you. The third ingredient that I want to talk about is our yeast. Okay? Now there's thousands of different varieties of yeast all around us in, in our environment. Um, it's on your skin, it's on the skin of your fruits, it's, it's everywhere, it's inside fruit, it's all over the environment. And some of these wild yeast might be beneficial to your fermentation process and do exactly the same thing that brewer's yeast would do, while others might be det detrimental to your fermentation and even spoil it if it's not properly controlled. This is why we firstly introduce our wanted yeast, uh, strain of yeast uh, to the process in order to establish a strong colony uh, within our wash or must. And secondly, we establish a strictly controlled environment in which the fermentation process is conducted. Okay, one might ask if one cannot use the wild yeast uh, in order to produce the alcohol. And yes, you can. We've, uh, our ancestors have done it for thousands of years. But you also don't know what other um, yeasts or bacteria organisms you introduce to your wash as well and you don't know what effect that will have on your fermentation and you also won't be able to get a consistent uh, to get consistent results from batch to batch uh, just like sourdough bread um, those of you that have baked sourdough bread and made your own starter, sourdough starter and stuff like that. You always say that each and every batch of bread tastes different because each and every starter is different uh, because the yeasts that you introduce are different. And that's a fun experiment and, and a tasty one as well. But if you want to have consistent results in your fermentation time after time, you want to be able to control your fermentation process. So this specific strain of yeast that we want to introduce to our, to our wash is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, a Latin word that's difficult to pronounce for an Afrikaans person, but 
I've done the best that I can. <laughs> okay, now it's exactly the same yeast that you use to make bread. Exactly the same thing. The only difference is how it was cultured. Bread yeast was cultured on grains and developed to produce more CO2, which is the little bubbles that let your dough rise. And brewer's yeast has been cultured and developed to produce alcohol and maybe a little less CO2. Uh, but it's developed to have a higher tolerance to alcohol before he dies. I'm sure that you've seen or heard people speak about wine yeast or beer yeast or lager yeast or uh, meat yeast. That's all the same yeast. It's just that it has been cultured in that medium for optimal performance in that process. So for this exercise, I'm going to use normal brewer's yeast. Uh, why? Because it's available at almost every grocery store and accessible to basically everybody. And it's cheap and it's just as functional. You can even use normal bread yeast because it's the same yeast. So the reason why we introduce our yeast into our wash is to make sure that we establish a strong colony of the yeast that will dominate uh, basically any other yeast that might be in our wash. So we introduce it into the environment and it will establish a colony and grow and spread from there and basically dominate any other yeasts that are there. Then we need to ensure that our environment is completely controlled. Now this yeast thrives in a poor oxygen environment. So that is why we create the environment by putting our wash in our fermenter and then we close it off with a lid and we put our bubbler on the in order for you know the gases to escape the CO2 gas that is produced by the by the yeast and also to keep any oxygen coming in um, if you've ever made um, vinegar you know that you know it's exactly the same same process uh, but when you introduce the acetobacter and oxygen into your alcohol um, the acetobacter basically eats the alcohol and then turns it into into vinegar um, so we want to eliminate that we want to control our environment that that doesn't happen so no air coming back in and um, we only produce the alcohol. So that brings us to our equipment that we need. Now, basic equipment that you will need is a primary fermentation vessel. For primary, I use plastic, uh, a plastic container, where, you know, my wash will be in with the water and my yeast and the fermentable sugars and it will happen in here like i said we need to seal it off you know to keep oxygen from coming in so this is my primary fermentation vessel as the process develops the, the yeast will consume the sugar it will produce alcohol and co2 and heat the gas will escape the co2 uh, carbon dioxide will escape um, and we are then turning this liquid into an alcoholic beverage. As it consumes the sugars, um, some sediments will fall out and lie on the bottom as well as, you know, some dead yeast cells. And we will do it in this fermentation vessel 
until um, our fer fermentation is visibly finished. You know, there's no more bubbles, uh, there's no more activity, it's visibly done. Then we will siphon our liquid from our primary fermentation vessel to our secondary fermentation vessel. And this one is a glass one. Okay, we will siphon it out without aerating the liquid at all. Uh, we don't want to, like I said, introduce uh, any other bacteria. So we siphon it without aerating it. And... Uh, you know, from that vessel to this vessel and without pulling any of the sediments through. Now, this is what we call our second fermentation uh, or the second fermentation vessel. So, this is just to check that it clarifies even more. If there's any fermentation that needs to finish, it will finish in here. Um, sediments again will trickle down to the bottom and your wash will clarify. Now, if there's any sediments that uh, trickle down to the bottom, it will be significantly less than uh, in your first fermentation. Okay, so um, I normally let this take about a week or so, but depending on, you know, your own uh, uh, observation, you know, you can basically decide for yourself when your wine is ready. Another piece of equipment that you will need is an airlock or a bubbler. I refer to it as a bubbler. Okay, and you don't need this. You can use a hose, you know, with the hole in the lid. Hose coming down into a normal jar that is all filled with water, and it's just so that the gas can escape again. The hose will be under the level of the water, it will bubble through, and no air can be pulled back into your fermentation. So you don't need a bubbler, you can just use a hose and a and a jar. I enjoy these bubblers because they are tiny and compact and fit right there and you don't have anything in your way uh, and it's it's cheap basically here's a line here that you fill your water level a year <clears throat> okay and what will happen is as uh, uh, your fermentation produces gas uh, it will push up the tube through here bubble through the water and escape from the top. Uh, the water or some people put sanitizer in, some people put alcohol in, I put normal water in. It's just to ensure that no air, oxygen is being pulled back into your wash. The hose, the hose we can use to siphon from ferment, uh, the first fermentation vessel to the next vessel um, and also to bottle when your process is finished you know to bottle it so that you can store it away um, also use it as your airlock the next thing is is a sanitizer it's very important before you do anything to completely sanitize and clean your vessels and equipment now, a lot of people buy expensive sanitizers and some people will promote it and it's good to have. It's nothing wrong with it. It's perfect. But also, normal dish soap and warm water will clean and sanitize your equipment. You can even use boiling water to sanitize it like you do when canning. Um, it's not a problem. All you want to do is clean everything and kill off any 
uh, bacteria that might be present uh, on in your vessels or on your equipment. Another thing that is very important, it's not necessary, but I would advise of having, having one, is a hydrometer. The reason for that, let me just open it here. Okay, now this is a three scale hydrometer. Okay, this one is marked in uh, bricks or gravity uh, and also it's got a scale for your alcohol by volume okay why this is so nice to have although it's not completely necessary is um, that it gives me my data point um, so what you do is you take your first uh, your original gravity or first um, gravity reading of before you add any yeast to your wash take the gravity reading of the wash and it will give you a certain reading on the scale um, and if you look at it it will show you the potential alcohol by volume that you might uh, be able to create from the wash and then after your fermentation is completely complete, you take a final gravity reading. And um, yeah, basically then you, you can ensure that your fermentation has completed completely um, in the first place. And second place, you can determine the alcohol by volume in your wine. Okay, it's not to be confused with your alcohol meter or a proof and a trail alcohol meter um, this is what we use in the stilling you know, to measure the alcohol content in your distillate okay another one <clears throat> also not completely necessary but it's handy to use with your hydrometer is your test uh, tube cylinder you know it fits my hydrometer perfectly and it's easy to monitor without me having to you know struggle by putting it in uh, the wash or bucket or whatever the case might be Another nice to have but not completely necessary thing is a kitchen scale. If you are going to add additional sugar to your uh, wash to ferment in order to bump up your alcohol, um, it's not, you know it's the kitchen scale is just nice to measure that as well. So this concludes basically our introductory video on the basics of home brewing. In the next video, we will start with, you know, the fermentation process of making my wife a lovely berry blaze wine uh, from store-bought juice. Uh, just another thing that I quickly want to touch on is your fermentation vessel. You don't need any special equipment. You can use a bucket with a lid. You can use a jar or a container like this. Um, just as long as you've got a contain container that can seal, um, you know, seal out any uh, oxygen or air coming in. Um, you can take a bucket and put a little hole in the lid for your hose or your bubbler. Um, you can use um, even your your uh, uh, containers where your juices or milk or whatever. Uh, as long as it's food grade, you can use use it. It's not 
necessary to be glass. Like I said, for my primary fermentation, I use, uh, you know, my plastic container. Um, I've got bigger ones, 25 liters, where I just use a, the bucket, uh, especially if I, if I make beer. Um, and then my second dairy uh, fermentation vessel is, is glass. Um, so you don't need any fancy equipment like the hydrometer. You don't need it, but it is nice to have because it gives you a bit of extra, uh, not really control, but to measure uh, your fermentation process um, and to see what's going on. Um, yeah, and that's it. So thank you for spending the day with us. If I may ask you a big favor, please like and sus subscribe this video, share it with your friends, um, and any questions, please email me. I'll add my email address here at the bottom, um, or pop a question in the, in the comments. I would really love to be more interactive with you guys. Um, and you know respond to you it will keep me busier it will keep me a lot more focused um there are things going on uh you know in the garden garden is going off um perfectly well but yeah i really want this channel to grow the only way that i can do it is to ask you to please like subscribe share and please make, make some contact. I really want to get in touch, you know, just, just see it. Even if you've got some criticism, quite on there. Um, let me know, you know, speak to me. I, I enjoy having contact and a conversation with people and it's one thing if you watch the video but it's another thing if we actually interact and then i know at least i'm reaching somebody or even if i'm boring you to death tell me listen dude you are boring me to death um but at least then i know okay so thank you for spending the day with us um, I will move over into the second video now, um, so you can, you know, just follow on that, but I'll cut this video off here and say thank you for spending time with me. Um, it's a joy. It's something that I enjoy doing and yes, may God bless you and I love you. See you in the next video. Bye.